Okay, and, and of course we couldn't do a, a panel discussing these kinds of issues about transnationalism, migration, and indigenous cultures without uh, involving somehow in some capacity in our professor uh, Jeff Cohen from the Department of Anthropology who is one of the specialists precisely of all these fields here on campus. Uh, professor Jeff Cohen, for those of you who, who might be uh, new to, uh, to the university, he got his PhD in anthropology from Indiana University and he has published extensively on issues related especially to Oaxacan uh, migration and the sending of remittances from the U.S. to, uh, to Oaxaca. Among his, works, uh, among his books are The Culture of Migration in Southern Mexico uh, and Cooperation and Community, Economy and Society in Oaxaca. Now he has a, a, a new and very exciting project studying uh, the Oaxacan communities that are emerging here in Columbus. Mm -hmm. So very soon I'm just anxious not to read something about uh, that research project in the near future. Please welcome Professor uh, Jeff Corey. Well, um, I'll stand up here for a few minutes. I, mean, I, don't, I don't have a lot of comments. I just want to thank um, all of the participants because these are just wonderful papers. So I just want to thank you. Moments like these when my brain really starts to work on it. They're so special. Because you know? everything else is filled with doing committee work. You know? it's, just, it's just so much fun to have your brain turn on. So. And so while I was listening to the papers, um, part of what, I, I'm just going to make a very few comments, and I'm not going to say anything really, really detailed about any of the papers. Um, I think they spoke for themselves in their strength and, 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 and their, their depth and breadth. Uh, which is just, again, wonderful. Uh, but a few things popped into my head. Um, and, and the most important was something that happened when I, when I started uh, presenting my work on, on migration from uh, the central valleys of Oaxaca in southern Mexico. Uh, most, of the, most of the communities, I work in um, several different communities in, in this region of, of uh, Oaxaca in southern Mexico, uh, and most of the communities I work in have really long, very, very uh, complex uh, stories of migration and connections to other parts of Mexico, mostly to the United States. It's very different than the examples from, from Peru, from Ecuador, in terms of debt. I mean, everybody from Mexico comes to the US. And they really don't go, go anywhere else. But uh, while I was listening to the papers and while I was thinking about the theme today, one of the things that, that just came, in, came, came to mind for me was in 1996 starting to talk about uh, migration in, in Oaxaca and the work that I do, uh, giving a, a, a lecture to a, a group of US and Mexican scholars on outcomes for the people that I'm working with. I work with primarily indigenous minority populations in, in, in Oaxaca, mostly Zapotec speakers. And uh, you know, I finished talking about pathways uh, that people are following, motivations, outcomes of remittance practices, what's going on in small rural communities. Finish my lecture, the room opens for discussion, and the person stands up and, and says, and dominates for the next half hour of the discussion with this question. He says, but they're Indians. What's going to happen to them? Isn't it horrible? Um, and one of the things that was so wonderful about today is we were so much farther along than that. The question is no longer this, this, I, this question of, well, what about the Indian? What about the, and, and, and it was this, this sense of, of, of you know, the, the poor India, the, the poor Indians. And I think Ula's paper in, in particular, this idea that we're looking at, at movers and they have their opportunities and there's disasters that affect everyone. Uh, when, when Fernando talks about the, the movies that, that people can make, and it, and it picks up on this idea of who's a good Maya. And we were talking last night, um, one of the things he, he told us last night was that the best Maya are the anthropologists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, and these are the things, and so these are, these are the moments um, that, that I think frames so much of what, what we've done in, um, in the past. Um, and I think what's so profoundly useful and what's, so, what's exciting about, the, again, the papers here today is that we're going from this very, uh, what I would say is a very, um, very 
concrete, very definite idea of transnational, where it's transnationalism, and the question becomes, are you or are you not transnational? And this goes back to this work with, with you know, Oaxacan groups saying, well, they may be transnational, but what about the poor Indian in this process? To what I, I think, if I'm hearing this all, all right and thinking about it correctly, is this idea of transnationalism as an emergent formation that people are playing around with and that has positives and negatives. And we're not going to, we're, we're not, our job isn't to say that this is good or this is bad or this is or is not transnational, but rather to say that, that these transnational formations are emergent from many different, uh, different kinds of um, uh, confrontations, if you will, that are occurring. And the confrontations, um, one of the points that we showed me, the confrontation is not between the population, the Otavalenos and the outside, the outsider, whoever that might be in the US, the, the European, but in fact it can be within the community. And so not only is it an emergent sense of, trans, of the transnational, and of transnational formations, but it's also an emergent sense that is framed by an idea of the individual as a social actor. And, and so it really, it's, it's just wonderful how far this has pushed from the very, the very kinds of early um, studies of transnationalism that um, really frame things to ask, are, are you, are you not, and then what are the, you know, and assuming that there must be negatives. Um, so that's, that's actually, I think the most important, one of the, for me at least, one of the most important pieces that comes out of, of the papers that we heard. Um, the other thing though that I do want to note is this idea of cosmopolitanism, because just as our very idea of what transnational is changes, and the way that we approach it changes, uh, going from this concrete thing to this emergent sort of this emergent formation that gets used in lots of different ways. Um, I think believe you were talking about how uh, there's this idea that Indians aren't cosmopolitan, and and that and and in a sense it it, it almost slices off a kind of uh, possibilities for for the populations that we're going to talk about by saying oh they can't be cos they're because they're Indian and maybe that in fact influences the statement of well what about the Indian Right, because obviously they can't be cosmopolitan. Well, uh, one of the things that happens there is, in, in fact, it, it begins to really alienate us from, or alienate our ability to talk about, I think, the imaginative ways, uh, imaginative possibilities that exist for, these pop for the populations. And, and I don't just mean Otavalo, Otavaleños in Otavalo, or somewhere else, or, you know, uh, Peruvians in Peru, or Mexicans in Catecans and you know, wherever they are, but you know, this is like Oaxacans in Oaxaca, in California, in Columbus, Ohio. There's a huge community here, not a huge community, but a community here. Uh, so it's, it's all the ways in which um, that, that imagination or that imaginative, um, create, creative future possibility of, of what might happen uh, is, in a sense, we say, oh, it, it can't happen because these people are not, in fact, cosmopolitan. Um, and, and so it, just so many things kind of um, uh, filled my head around this um, as I was, I, was, I was listening to everyone talk. Um, but so those are the, the kinds of things that I think are, are just so important. Um, this idea of an emergent kind of transnationalism, a trans, uh, an, an idea that really begins to embrace uh, individuals as social actors who are producing that transnational, uh, those transnational formations in their in their very lives, and that it's not closed in terms of of some sort of anthropological attitude of or cultural attitude of these are Indians, these are not, um, and then that concern with are you uh, are you in a sense becoming the migrant, becoming the transnational. Uh, whether it's through music or film or uh, mobility, but s forsaking your past. And what all these examples show us is that you do, you, you're, that's not the choice. The choice is not to pick one, forsake the other, but in fact how to pull them together in these kinds of creative ways. And people are doing this um, in, uh, in every day, in everyday ways. Uh, for me, one of the most interesting was uh, my, my student Bernardo, who followed this in terms of basketball. So we don't think of them necessarily, even as, 
as uh, the, you know, it's music, it's museums, it's, uh, it's dress, it's language, it's sport, it's, it's all of these things together. So anyway, so I just want to thank all the three of you again for some wonderful, wonderful papers. Um, I think we have a good, good amount of time for questions. Um, if you have questions for any of the uh, participants or if you want to just ask things to the panel, and um, I, I don't think we need like a, I don't think I need to direct questions or anything, but if you'd like, I can do that. <laughs> certainly as a professor, I know how to do that. <laughs> Uh, I agree that it is really wonderful at this time of the semester to be ta have our head taken away from our own departmental politics or whatever it is, so I thank you both. But I'm wondering if we're seeing maybe two ideal types of cosmopolitanism here or whether they turn into the same thing if we look at them more closely. Um, so I'm thinking about Otavalan exceptionalism. And um, you know, if we contrast your case and the Mayan case, you know, we can maybe go to these theories of ethnicity, you know, Frederick Barth and America Paredes' students and so forth, who talk about identity performance being constructed in trade encounters, being constructed at borders, because if you're there, you know, in the middle of the Mayan universe, speaking Mayan, you don't have to worry about what you are. It's not necessary for you to give yourself a label. But the Otavalans, um, you know, in contrast, you can almost wonder whether these particular small groups are really the prototypes of our contemporary ethnic identity politics in the sense that um, I know groups like this in Europe too, uh, from the 18th century, mountain people, people who at least in European terms are sort of coded as indigenous also, <coughs> whose living is made by peddling a distinctive craft you know, again, a distinctive craft, uh, and by sort of packaging it in an identity performance. And as, um, you know, as in your case, but in contrast to the, per to the Peruvian case, um, the, tend to be, the destination just has to be where there's a certain um, cosmopolitan xenophilia. People are interested in strange kinds of music, or people are interested in, you know, interesting goods that they haven't got. So I'm thinking of, um, you know, in, there's uh, one valley in Tuscany, Banjiviluca, that since the 18th century has been exporting people who make plaster saints. And they've gone to, you know, already in the 18th century, but by the end of the 19th century, they were in New Guinea, Australia, Brazil, you know, Philadelphia, everywhere. And they, you know, they're the ones I knew in Philadelphia describe a situation very much like yours. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, um, you know, the Peruvian situation seems more typical in the sense that you have a particular political economy that brings certain kinds of people there when certain kinds of opportunities open up, and by the same token, it sends them out through certain kinds of relationships into labor networks that don't have to do with their particular identities. They're doing work that is not marked. Mm -hmm. It's not performative. So this is the special case, you know, mm -hmm. these groups who go and perform as indigenous and sell something that is marked with identity. It's the special case, but in a way it's the model that bigger places now emulate, you know, that now the Mayans looking to tourism or whatever, you know, now we're all becoming little indigenous <coughs> groups in relation to some <laughs> something up there. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I wonder if this um, interest in Native American paraphernalia has yeah. something to do with this, you know, it's creating that, that type of aura. One thing that I would say is that um, Otavalans don't go where people have an interest in the exotic or the novelty or things. They actually create desire. <laughs> so they will go places where no one, like in Australia or Africa, you know, where it's where people don't necessarily have a, there's not a, a market niche for them already made, but they actually go and they create it. And what makes me say this is because um, uh, a couple of Adalans were, were amazed. You know, they, they said, oh, we saw these tios, which is Adalan young people who, we saw these, these uh, tias, actually, they were, they were women, in the Oriente, so this is in the, in the Amazon area, selling sweaters, and, and to them, it just blew their mind, you know, that, and the people were buying them. And so it blew their mind, they said, ¿Por dónde mis mandaremos? Like, 
we're everywhere, you know, including these places where you would not normally think you know, that the homes would go. So, but those are true, you know, I mean, the Andes has a whole lot of intertribal trade and exchange of music mm -hmm. and stuff. And there's a concern, I think, about multivalinization <coughs> also, it, exactly what you're saying, that there are other communities that are imitating. Mm -hmm. um, they, they see the success, you know, of the Atalans and they're imitating, and so then there's sort of a struggle between adopting identities that, that are not representative of their locality. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with the observation because I do think that the Otavalan case uh, and, and other scholars have said it also has to be exceptional. And, and partly, it's probably the trade diaspora mm -hmm. thing also that they have this autonomy that a regular uh, labor migrant does not have mm -hmm. and because they're dependent on getting paid from somebody else. Right. You know? And here it's like your own, it's your own investment, your own risks, or that of your family, et cetera, et cetera. But there is sort of like an economic autonomy. Uh, and you know, again, I, th I think it's right also that they, they, they are sort of the prototype of, 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 of this root metaphor of mobility as something desirable and, and unproblematic, right? That you can come and go as you wish. Uh, so, so, it, it, so, which, you know, it, it, that was great about your second part of the talk also was that it, it's not quite like that and there are all these visa constraints and, and, and but that they might not have been sort of, they might have somehow been able to go under the radar in a, in a way that other labor migrants have mm -hmm. perhaps not. But with the, the cosmopolitanism discussion, I'm, I'm glad that you're raising it also, <coughs> Jeff, because I think, um, you know, we are all trying to to think of how can we come up with terms and, and, and sort of new analytics for thinking about this uh, new stages of, of transnational practice and transnational formation. And, but somehow with the cosmopolitanism also, there, there seems to be like almost the same sort of trap uh, that there was at the beginning of the transnationalism literature, right? That it becomes sort of this normative thing where we can then decide whether are you or are you not, you know? Are you open to the world? Well, I am on good days, but when I, <laughs> when I wake up and I'm really grumpy, I'm certainly not, you know? So, so, so how can we use it as a sort of more flexible? And I think for me in my, in my own work, and I don't know if this is a solution, but, but focusing on it as a sort of a practice, right? Uh, uh, almost a competency. Uh, that people try to imitate. I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, some sort of ideal. You know, a lot of the, the migrants that I've worked with, they know that in order to uh, perform well in this at this visa interview, and it will increase the chances of some, you know, U.S. government official at the embassy in Lima to actually grant them the visa, is that they that they feel convincing about their urban uh, and their cosmopolitan competence, right? So it is about sort of this ease of being able to transit and not being outed, you know, as a sort of an X rule subject, but be able to transit with ease in these sort of more elite urban, sp urban spaces. So I think the sort of whole embodied aspect uh, of this is, is, um, is really important to it. Maybe I can jump in on this. So my, my position is really different than this. I think that um, the islands are cosmopolitan first and transnational second. Mm -hmm. So one of the curiosities that I've had is what people seem so confident about their ability to travel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they have that confidence before the experience of actually mm -hmm. attempting any of this. Um, in a different paper, I talk about um, so our deep knowledge of the past and all of these dimensions mm -hmm. and connected you know, to some of these uh, experiences and the transnational experiences. Now, so there's something enduring in terms of the values, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the idea of distant knowledge, you know, and having access to distant knowledge. You don't want to think about the shaman networks you know, and how their power depends on that ability mm -hmm. to integrate distant knowledge into knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, I wonder where that leads. It, it's something that I've, that I've struggled with, but I think that it, it, the confidence about mm -hmm. it is so yeah. strong yeah. that it really compels us to think yeah. about 
beyond the experience, beyond exposure to tourism, beyond media, you know, this comes from something much yeah. more deep, deeper than in indigenous culture. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I am familiar with both study cases with Otavalan that with the Huancainos, no? <laughs> and I know this reviewing the bibliography. Uh, uh, in those, in, uh, and I know is that in those uh, two study study cases, no, there was you can trace historically. Mm -hmm. the, the Otavalans and the Huancainos. Uh, there is some moment in history that they were cosmopolitan against themselves. Against themselves. And they but they, because they have to they have to live for many reasons. They have to live the the the, the place. But later the cosmopolitanism in in easy terms, no? Be, uh, became culture, and they want to live because in the Otavalan, I, I read some ethnographies in the Otavalan case, and also in the Huancaino or other re Quechua regions, that uh, they have to live, for example, before marrying. But, but that it is a new requirement to to marry, <laughs> the, especially the the the, the men or, or the males of this of this community. They have to show hmm, some cosmopolitan or transnational experience in order to be hmm, accepted. They, they become sexier if they have. <laughs> okay, and, and, and there are lots of <laughs> lots of ethnographies, lots of things. So that cosmopolitanism becomes culture, and now they don't need to live anymore. Many of the are are rich. The same thing. Many one kinds are very rich, there is like a new indigenous bourgeoisies in both places, but they they have to live at the same time. Everyone wants to live, for example, in the case of Jano Tabala, the German Kainos, they have to go somewhere in order to come back. And not necessarily for looking for money, because that's the, the experience, the act. No? And I would like to ask if you have explored all those those issues because I am using those two categories no? for my next book. Okay, <laughs> but I, I am working with <laughs> with music, fusion music, and, and in one part of my argument is, is, is this. When no? Maybe it's not about the cosmopolitanism, although I think that that has, uh, definitely has status, and depending on where you travel, mm -hmm. it may have more status or less status, no? But I also see it as an extension of the compadre networks. So it's about networks, no? The same, the same reason, the same thing that made uh, Otavalan sexy, you know, mm -hmm. marriageable back in the day in terms of their connections, you know, uh, with family members and kids of kin, I think operates today at a global level. Um, w one of the things that I was thinking, uh, and, and that's something that I try to, to highlight also in my other work, is that the, around this whole issue of cosmopolitan competency and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can claim you can claim to be it, right? Uh, you can claim whatever you want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that yeah. other people are going to grant you uh, <laughs> the, you know, the authority to claim. Uh, um, and I think in in Peru, still, uh, perhaps not so much con los Juancainos, but definitely with uh, people from other uh, regions. That you know, even if you claim to be, you know, out worldly, etc. there is still a, sort of a policing of the boundaries of who can be cosmopolitan uh, and who can be transnational. So there's a very strong uh, sort of uh, feeling still among uh, elites, mm -hmm. old money elites mm -hmm. uh, in Lima who are, who are still, you know, uh, trying to sort of protect their turf, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've just constantly come across this, this this sort of resistance to the mobility of the Andean other, right? Uh, where, you know, it becomes
cantar. Y, y este chorro que se cree, ¿no? Porque tienen plata. So it's like you can go out and you can, you can make money, but that doesn't give you access to that sort of old elite social spaces that, that before was the currency of, 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 uh, of social and cultural capital. And I, I think that's, that's something really important. Then for the Wampangan in particular, I think there's something, I mean, there has been opportunities for them under neoliberalism mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's, they somehow thrived under this neoliberal entrepreneurship. So, so now there's this fascination with the, with the you know, el cholo emprendedor, no? Mm -hmm. uh, because in, in essence, el cholo emprendedor is the, the ideal neoliberal subject, right? Mm -hmm. the, the sort of self-regulating uh, business, <coughs> small business owner, etc. And one of the, uh, I'm starting up uh, a new project that I'm going to do a little bit of field work for this summer, and it's about um, what happens to the, this new uh, uh, clase emergente, uh, not the same as the clase emergente like in the 70s with the first round of migrations, but, but uh, you know, uh, people from who, are, who are now third or more generation of, of uh, Andean descent in the city but we're still not somehow breaking into the dominant uh, circle, right? And, and you also know it's a, a topic that I'm exploring in a, in a film book through this one poet who, who exemplifies this, uh, this dynamic. Uh, so, so, there's so this project, I'm trying to focus on schools and the investments uh, in schools. It, it's, it's almost as if it were like, Escuelas, pero para cholos con plata, ¿no? Escuelas privadas para cholos con plata. Because it's, uh, it's like, you know, you have aspirations, they're not only economic, uh, but you also now want to send your child to a private school, but unfortunately you cannot get into the Humboldt or whatever all these private schools in Lima, you know, so, so there, there's all this stuff going on, all this institution building around uh, institutions that can accommodate this new, um, Ethnic uh, um, strata, you know. So I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think I'm just trying to respond to. All, all of these questions are kind of going to something that I noticed across all three talks, which was the role of privilege in mm -hmm. transnationalism. And I thought when you talked about Japan, for example, as a destination versus other places, and Willow, when you talked about the um, the role of papers and mm -hmm. um, Kind of access to, to papers, and then um, Francisco, when you were talking about the um, kind of who gets to define being Maya, and so as kind of through these questions, it, it it's kind of it looks to me kind of like cosmopolitanism or transnationalism is, is kind of a gateway of privilege, right? Where not everybody gets in, um, and people who go through are transformed in different ways. Um, so I was wondering if if maybe. Um, you could talk about how privilege works in the situation that you described. No, I would say that in general, the thing is that the people who are actually doing this is like a, we can say something like mediated cosmopolitanism. So there are some sources through which you have to take in order to be displayed or to be achieved in display in such and such a spaces. So they are not getting right there through which they think. And in most cases, they define themselves as peasants or just, let's say, regular person. We can say, talking about that, that they are just white people who are just interested in these cases. But in the other cases, this, there is like a special interest to go beyond. And what I think is also important is that this, have, uh, this idea of Mayans can be modern in a way they can shift and manage their identity in different, very creative ways. So not to say, well, do you think that Mayan people this goes to, to the tradition and the cultural preservation or whatever? They think we can recreate our own past. And the things to which we do that is about uh, using and considering first themselves and defining themselves as you know, people of Maya, but at the same time say, okay, we're gonna take this like a, that basis of foundation of what we are doing, and we are going to recreate our holistic experience of being Maya and promote that outside the world. That's what I think would be the, the two main issues in those terms. So those are those would be the modern Mayas. Mm -hmm. 
the Modern Dialects, the whose, whose stage are uh, the international festivals, whose, uh, whose stage are actually internet, and they are also supported and looking for distribution from the NGOs and some other funding there, and they are competing with some other people at the international level for this fund. So mm -hmm. they have to, to do that in order to create and recreate a media and image of the Mayan and representation of the Mayan people, but at the same time, they have to recreate themselves in terms of moving forward and competing in, 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 in for, for funds and for recognition. So, mm -hmm. Just briefly, think about what, what do you use that privilege for? I think that that's an important difference. So in some cases, people may use it for commercial purposes. You know, other people may use it as cultural ambassadors. You know? So that uh, this idea of what type of image you put out there, what type of representation, and who does it, is important. But the other thing that I wanted to sort of mention and in in maybe hear from other people thinking about these things is one, I, I would differentiate between transnationalism and cosmopolitanism. There are plenty of people who travel extensively, but they're not cosmopolitan. And having said that, in, in the work that I do, I also try to differentiate between political, economic, and moral cosmopolitans. And I think that they play out in very different ways, and they involve different uh, positionings and different types of empowerment, you know, as we talk about social actors, uh, very different types, you know, so we may all be talking about the same thing, but potentially not, <laughs> depending on where we come down with that. And just one, I, I, I love how you phrase it as, as cosmopolitanism as a gateway to privilege, I mean, or as something that people can mobilize in order to try to, uh, you know, get to migrate, if that is a goal or, or, um, or whatever the goal is. Because I think it is so important, uh, you know, even as we are focusing on, on social actors and, 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 and on agencies, I'm, I'm still that much of a structuralist that I want to <laughs> keep, the, keep the, 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 the racialization processes and all of these things in check that does put limits onto the claims that people can make uh, uh, for their own lives, right, and for their own identities. And I think in, in, in the Peruvian case, at least, you know, what I've seen in my field work is that, you know, the, the sort of cosmopolitan competence becomes a strategy against racism in Peru also. But at the same time, you also desire that national belonging, but it's like you have to go abroad and revindicate yourself and, 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 and in all sorts of ways in order to be able to come back and, and claim it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the gateway thing, I, I, I like that a lot. Thank you. Well, I, I think we have to stop it. Thank you. I speak for all of us when I say I would just like you all to come back and do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, you're here to do it, but we're going to come back and do this again for us because it's so interesting. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we have a few more minutes if you just have one. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.